terrible is fever. I'll start my talk with a case scenario. We had a 27-year-old boy who presented with history of fever and headache for two days and had one episode of generalized tonic-clonic seizures and loss of consciousness one hour before presenting to the hospital. On examination, he was unconscious with minimal response to the painful stimuli. Um, his blood pressure was 180 by 100, temperature of 101, and he had a evidence of oral bleed due to the tongue bite. There was no pallor, rectus, cyanosis, clubbing, or lymphadenopathy. On CNS examination, his meningeal signs were negative. His pupils were bilateral, equally detecting to the light. There was no focal neural deficit. His planters were bilaterally mute. And all the systemic examination was normal. A diagnosis of febrile encephalopathy with recent onset of seizures was made. He was started on sportive treatment. And with sportive treatment, <coughs> his uh, general condition started improving and he was sent for MR examination as he has localized uh, sign in the form of seizures. Acute fever, if we talk of acute fever, we have two types of patients in our practice. One are the patients in which we have some localizing signs and symptoms pertaining to a particular system like respiratory system, gastrointestinal tract, urinary tract, skin and soft tissue infection and so on. While the other category is the most difficult to evaluate is acute undifferentiated febrile illness. So I will be more concentrating on acute undifferentiated febrile illness which is defined as any fever of more than 38.3 degrees centigrade lasting for more than two days and up to two weeks. There are a lot of guidelines for management of a fever of unknown reason which we call as PU. But there are very few guidelines for management of acute febrile illness. Recently, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and Association of Physicians of India have recommended some guidelines and given us a uh, roadmap for the evaluation of acute undifferentiated fever. I will be going according to that. So they have advised a syndromic approach and a stepwise uh, care to patients of acute undifferentiated febrile illness. The first step I will be taking will be patient profile and to assess disease severity, then the localizing signs, and then identifying the clinical syndrome, and after that perform the first line and confirmatory test and initiate empirical therapy, and then after the diagnosis is made is about the specific therapy. So the patient's profile and disease severity, we should see the geographical area from where patient is belonging, his comorbidities like associated cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension and history of drugs and if there is any immunosuppressive status or not. Immediately on presentation of the patient, we should see for the some red flag signs whether the patient requires hospitalization or he can be treated on OPD basis. The important red flag signs are severe prostration Respiratory date of more than 22 or patient is hypoxic with saturation less than 92. He has a hypotension BP less than 90 by 60. He has altered mental status or presence of seizures. Severe persistent vomiting, pallor, jaundice or if there is a bleeding from any side. At this very stage we should look for the sepsis. Because sepsis every minute matters in the management of sepsis. Earlier we used to define sepsis with the search criteria and a localized site of infection. Now it has been taken over by the SOFA score. SOFA is Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score, which is quite cumbersome to evaluate. So they have suggested is a quick SOFA score in which we take three things, a respiratory rate of more than 22, a GCS less than 13, and systolic blood pressure less than 90, along with the presence of a site of a localized infection. And if the patient has hypotension requires a vasopressor support, we label it as a septic shock. All such patients require admission in the ICU. In the first hour, what they have prescribed is a consider it as a medical emergency and a uh, one hour bundle, the first hour bundle has been advised, which includes starting the uh, IV fluids, taking samples for blood culture, serum lactate level apart from the routine samples and uh, administer broad spectrum antibiotics after we have taken the samples for blood culture. At least two blood culture samples has to be taken in all these patients. And uh, 
begin a rapid infusion of uh, fluids to improve the blood pressure. If the patient's blood pressure doesn't improve with the administration of fluids and uh, crystalloids, we should start the vasopressor therapy so as to maintain a mean arterial blood pressure of more than 65 mm of mercury. Then I move on to step 2, that is localizing signs of infection if they are there present in that particular individual. In these things of localized sites, we should do a, after a complete history, we should do a thorough physical examination which can give us a clue to the localization of the infection. Starting from the CNS, we should look for meningeal signs, history of any focal seizure or neurodeficit. Then in the uh, throat, we should look for all tonsils, any pharyngeal, ear discharge, any tonsil enlargement, and any lymph lymphadenopathy in the neck. Moving on to respiratory system, a thorough examination of the chest, presence of any crepitations, and then we look for abdominal, liver tenderness, Murphy signs, so we have to diagnose hepatobiliary diseases. Uh, all these are important because we can plan our investigation like a patient requires earlier chest x-ray or ultrasound modalities or any other neuro amazing techniques as per the localization of the infection. Then that localization of the infection is treated accordingly. There are few signs which sometimes are helpful in the diagnosis. Like we can have a presence of Ascher in scrub typhus. It's very important to look for Ascher. This is almost if present is pathognomonic of scrub typhus. They should be looked in the, especially in the genitalia area, abdominal folds, breast folds, where it's quite uh, common. And we can have a perpetrate rash of meningococcemia, sometimes tiki rash in dengue, and uh, uh, typical appearance of rash in uh, varicella also. Then I go on to the syndromic approach which has been advocated in undifferentiated fever. So they have divided uh, undifferentiated uh, fever into five categories, five syndromes. Like you can have acute uh, undifferentiated febrile illness with presence of thrombocytopenia with or without rash, along with, uh, uh, with jaundice, with renal failure or evidence of multiple organ dysfunction, and patients with presenting with ARDS or patients presenting with encephalopathy. Most of the conditions sometimes we see overlap of one over the two. So these things have to be taken uh, in mind. The important causes of like thrombocytopenia with rash are dengue, chikungunya, tachycardia, meningococcal, leptospirosis, measles, rubella and falsifa malaria. The patient presenting with ARDS, the common causes look for H1N1 and COVID if they are prevalent in the community and sometimes patients of uh, Falsifa malaria and leptospira can also present with ARDS. Patient presenting with jaundice and renal failure, uh, many diseases are common to have both uh, liver involvement and renal involvement like leptospirosis, falsifa malaria and uh, scrub dengue, complicated malaria you can have both, scrub typhus you can have both and macrophages activation syndrome is another entity in this. And very important is presenting with encephalopathy. A common cause of presenting fever with encephalopathy will be meningoencephalitis, herpes simplex encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis, cerebral malaria is a very common to present as febrile encephalopathy. Five common causes of acute undifferentiated febrile illness in India. Uh, if the prevalence of these diseases vary from area to area in India. Like malaria in some of the areas, it's up to just 5% and up to 50%. Arboviral infection, which include dengue and chikungunya, is from 5 to 19%. <coughs> Enteric fever is again from 7 to 30%. And spiroketal and recursive infection, which were not earlier so commonly diagnosed, have a good prevalence of 10% in lepta and up to 49% in scrub typhus. I try to collect some data from, uh, 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 from the Punjab government data and also from the medical colleges in Punjab. And I found that the dengue is uh, as common in primary care hospitals also. Uh, this is my hospital figure. We had 18% of patients of fever suffering from dengue. 
and in tertiary medical colleges also it's around 19 percent. In Punjab last year we have 11,000 cases and this year because of the lot of rains and floods already in one month we had 5,000 cases of dengue. Chicken gunia is also very common and this year also the Punjab government has figure shows around 500 cases in last two months. The prevalence of chicken gunia in tertiary care hospitals is up to 6.5%. Lepto is also it's increasing. 68 cases have been seen in 2023 in Punjab. And so is scrap. It's increasing uh, uh, diagnosis of scrap and lepta, though it has rarely been uh, diagnosed at periphery. Malaria is now decreasing the uh, trend we have seen of uh, malaria patients. We can rule out some common causes from some uh, uh, by diagnosis exclusion. Like if you have a rash and lymphadenopathy on clinical examination, we can rule out malaria and enteric fever. Similarly, if we have Escher, I already told you, we can diagnose scrub typhus. And if the patient is having fever more than 12 days, and uh, with combination of a normal tourniquet test and a normal leukocytic count, we can rule out a dengue. Then I move on to that we should perform first line and confirmatory tests if possible and we should initiate the empirical therapy. So we have here first set of patients presenting with acute febrile illness without any systemic features and without any red flag signs. These are the patients presenting in OPD. They are not serious patients, no red flag signs are there. So first test we should do is a rapid detection test, CAR test for malaria. For P, Fancy Palm, HRP2 kits are available. This is histidine rich protein which is specific for Fancy Palm. If this is positive, this carries a good sensitivity and specificity. We can state we diagnose that we are dealing with the patients of P, Fancy Palm malaria and that patient can be given uh, Arthimuthar and uh, Limifentry in oral dose. And if that patient is negative, like his rapid detection test for malaria, we should do two CAR tests 12 hours apart before labeling it as a negative for malaria. If it is negative and fever is less than three days, no specific treatment is given, no specific investigations are required at this time because we don't have any empirical therapy for this. So patient should be managed with just rest, antiparatics and supportive treatment. We should take care of hydration. But if patient is having fever for more than three days, at presentation. Then we should do all the investigations which like complete blood counts, biochemistry, urine analysis, blood cultures, C-reactor protein, chest x-ray if required. Then specific testing for etiologies for dengue, leptas, crop typhus, for enteric fever and so on. If uh, uh, and before we, are, we get results of any of these tests, we can start empirical therapy. For this empirical therapy advised is a combination of sufixime along with doxycycline and dose of 100 mg BD. If doxycycline is contraindicated, then we can start empirical therapy of a sufixime with azithromycin. Now, the second thing is if we are having fever along with presence of thrombocytopenia with or without rash, with the liver involvement, with the renal involvement, or with ARDS. Here, if we patient presenting with ARDS, if COVID or H1N1 is prevalent, we should immediately take samples for those. And other thing we should do again, malaria in these patients, as I've already told, such patients are admitted in the hospital. And uh, here we give injectable artesunate, 2.5 mg per kg body weight, at 0 hour, 12 hour, 24 hour, then every 24 hour and complete 5 days of treatment. In addition, we send all the investigations, like we send patients, uh, I have already told you all the patients where fever is more than 3 days, even without uh, thrombocytopenia or hepatic renal involvement, all the samples are to be sent in such patients. And empirical therapy is again started in these patients. Antiparatics use only paracetamol, avoid aspirin, IV fluids, oxygen therapy if it is required. Then we watch for bleeding, hypoxia, 
urine output and development of shock in such patients. Here we start injectable empirical therapy with ceftroxone 2 gram IV once a day along with injectable or oral doxycycline and same if doxycycline is contraindicated because like pregnancy or in early lactation phase we can uh, give azithromycin. Specific therapy is started only once we get a positive result for any other infection. It is like a few rapid tests or confirmatory tests. I like to highlight that serological tests which are antibody based. We consider these as confirmatory only on demonstration of fourfold rise in titer of IgG or zero conversion in IgM uh, in a paired specimen. A single specimen should not be considered enough for making a confirmatory diagnosis. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of a malarial CAR test varies from 95 to 95% sensitive and 95% specific, especially from PFLC palm. The dengue antigen card has low sensitivity, but it is specific, it's positive. So batteries do go for NS1 antigen ELISA in the earlier stage, and if patient presents after more than five days, we should go for antibody test. The same is for lepta, enteric fever and scrub typhus that we should do antibody test in all these patients. The empirical therapy which I just told you, the rationale behind this therapy is that I have given a combination of ceftroxin and doxycycline. Ceftroxin is drug of choice for enteric fever and it's also a drug very effective in lepta and same is doxycycline which is a factor in leptospirosis and in scrub typhus. As per recommendations of the Association of Physicians of India, empirical treatment with doxycycline is clinically appropriate strategy for reducing morbidity and mortality in patients of non-malarial acute undifferentiated febrile illness. Now we have patients presenting with encephalopathy acute febrile illness with encephalopathy. So immediately on arrival of the patient, we should assess the patient and support ABC, that is airways, breathing and circulation. We should immediately, the first step should be to measure blood glucose level, that we may not be dealing with a hypoglycemia or a hyperglycemia with fever. Manage accordingly, all such patients should be started off for hydration and antipyretics, that should be the first step. And if patient has got seizure, immediate anti-epileptics has to be started. We see for features of raised ICP because if we have focal signs or raised intracranial pressure, the first thing will be to start measures to lower the ICP, which is like IV manitol or hypertonic spline, proper position, fever and seizure control, steroid wherever they are indicated. And all such patients, once the seizures are controlled and we have started uh, uh, decreasing ICP therapy, we should send these patients for neuroamazing. On the other hand, if we have focal signs absent, then we can go for lumbar puncture. Before going for lumbar puncture, all such patients should be sent for, uh, we should do ABG, CBC, complete biochemistry in all these patients. Apart from the uh, diagnostic test, uh, specific test uh, which we have which I have advised in patients so far, uh, simple AF way with thrombocytopenia or renal hepatic involvement. So CSF should be sent for biochemistry cytology, gram stain culture, and also for viral PCR for herpes simplex. If available, biofire for CSF or biofire should also be sent. So all such patients should have malaria testing, and if malaria is positive, we should treat it as a cerebral malaria, and if the malaria is negative, all such patients should be started on empirical therapy, which is injections of toxin 2 gram intravenously twice daily. This is a uh, expected mean, uh, diagnosed and meningitic uh, dose. And because every minute matters in such patients, and we should also start with a acyclovir 10 mg per kg body weight intravenously 8 hourly. Because acyclovir is effective only in the first 48 hours, if it started in herpes simplex and several patient, so it, should, it is a part of empirical therapy. I have already told you specific testing for all 
and direct dengue scrub lepta should also be immediately done. A few lines about biofire. Biofire test is a FDA cleared syndromic test. It is a uh, PCR test and which is which detects which targets the 14 important pathogens which include bacteria, virus and fungus and these 14 are the most common causes of CNS infections. And this just 0.2 ml of CSF can give us a target the uh, causative organism within one hour. This is available in uh, now a lot of centers in India and daily it's available in many centers. Then a few lines about empirical therapy in patient of sepsis which I said that we should give a broad spectrum antibiotics in the first hour of the sepsis bundle management. So we initiate empirical therapy in patients of sepsis and septic shock within first hour of present, presentation. The preferred drugs are, uh, which have been described is imunipenem in doses of 500 mg IV sex hourly along with combination of micacin 15 mg per kg body weight uh, once a day and in addition uh, we can add vancomycin if we are suspecting MRSA and uh, if patient has already been antibiotics from outside we can straight away start with the ticoplanin in the prescribed doses. Alternative to imnipanum and we can use a combination of uh, Miropanum or Peprasilin plus Tazopectum. Daily, uh, uh, daily treatment has to be considered on daily basis and we can monitor sepsis with the help of Procalcitonin levels. Procal is a good test to monitor the sepsis. Then I move on to specific therapy. Once uh, we have uh, diagnosed uh, in, in this much time, we will get the reports of specific tests which I have already said. Specific therapy for malaria, especially cerebral malaria, especially if it's a falsi for malaria. I already told you about drug of choice is uh, artisanate. Alternative in uh, cerebral malaria, earlier we used to use quinine, uh, especially in patients of uh, pregnancy in the first trimester but now artesunate has been approved in the first trimester of pregnancy also. In enteric fever, ceftroxin in the doses of uh, around 2 gram intravenously OD remains drug of choice. For scrub typhus, doxycycline is the drug of choice and in leptospirosis, penicillin G is the drug of choice. While in dengue, uh, we should maintain a uh, we should give isotonic fluids uh, and keep a watch on the hematocrit level. It should be guided by the serial hematocrit determinations. Blood transfusion in dengue is done only if there is a overt bleeding or if there is a rapid fall in the hematocrit or the platelet count is less than 10,000. We should keep a watch in the vulnerable population, especially Consider the comorbidities like some of the patients of uh, cardiovascular diseases may be on blood thinners or anticoagulants and in many patients of fever presenting with thrombocytopenia and if the, we find that platelet counts are below 50,000 we should immediately stop the blood thinners. We should take key patients of malignancy, malignancy especially who are on chemotherapy, they are immunocompromised host, post transplant patients we consider as the immunocompromised host. We should also keep a watch in old age because some old age patients are not having fever but they may be having underlying source of infection. Just two slides more. Uh, then febrile neutropenic patients I like to say that any oral temperature of more than 38 degrees centigrade if it's sustained over one hour or two consecutive readings of just 38 degrees centigrade for two hours with absolute neutrophilic count less than, less than 500. It should be considered as febrile neutropenia and should be very aggressively treated. So immediately these such patients should be preferably admitted and started on cephoparazine sylvectum along with amicacin. All such patients should be monitored every day and in the 48 hour no response is there. We should add vancomycin and still if in two days no response is there we should consider giving antifungal 
and uh, liposomal amphotericin B remains the drug of choice. We should also keep in mind some non-infectious causes of acute febrile illness like pontine hemorrhage, neuromalignant syndrome and so on. Coming back to my case from where I started, so patient was sent for neuromaging. All the routine investigations were normal except for leukocytosis. Patients all rapid car test, malaria, dengue, typhi, CRP, blood cultures are negative. His CSM examination showed PCR was positive for herpes simplex 1. His MRI did show subtle T2 and T2 flare hyperintensity involving bilateral medial temporal lobes, which is a confirmatory of viral encephalitis. This patient was already on a cycle which started as empirical therapy, so that was continued for two weeks. And patient, see, patient CSM report came on third day. So that was the advantage of starting empirical therapy that otherwise 72 hours would have wasted if we have not given the empirical therapy. So take home messages, a stepwise syndromic evaluation of acute febrile illness should be considered. We should base evidence-based algorithm which can guide primary physicians or specialists to use relevant diagnostic modalities and initiate early empirical therapy based on the clinical syndromes for better management of fever. AIMS, have, AIMS New Delhi has a, uh, a designed an appropriate antibiotic therapy for all the localized site of infection conditions. And they have developed an app also. So for an appropriate antibiotic therapy, we can take help of that app, which will guide us for antibiotic therapy. Thank you so much for a very patient Thank you, sir. For the next talk, I would like to invite Dr.